Welcome to the International Spy Museum. I'm Amanda Olke, the, the Director of Adult Education here. Delighted to have you here this evening. Very fascinate, fascinating evening lined up that centers around this wonderful new book, Disinformation, which also has an accompanying documentary. Tonight, you're going to hear both comments from one of the co-authors, and then you'll see um, a screening of about 30 minutes uh, from the from the documentary and just to give you a little orientation for the evening um, Ron Rishlock will do the talk he'll answer questions then then we'll do the screening just so you understand the flow of the evening uh, delighted to welcome Ron here this evening he has to speak because his co-author cannot join us here um, Lieutenant General Pacepa did I do it? Did I not? I didn't do it, did I? Did it? Pachepa, better, better. I'm terrible at names. You have to forgive me. Uh, was the highest ranking Soviet bloc intelligence officer to ever defect. And his uh, first book, I believe, caused his former boss to have a nervous breakdown, Ceausescu, another name that I'll say badly, but you know who I mean. And now he has worked with Ron on this book, Disinformation, about the Russian born science of influence, and I know we're going to hear some very interesting stories. Ron is rather uniquely positioned to uh, work on this. He is currently the Butler Snow Lecturer and Professor of Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, and he also serves as the university's faculty athletics representative. He practiced law in Chicago before that at Jenner and Black, and he served as a clerk to Judge Harry Welford of the U.S. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, he's the author of eight books. Uh, he's been a contributor to the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and other distinguished publications. He has some very interesting contacts and connections that I wanted to brief you on. Um, He's a member of the committee appointed by the Mississippi Supreme Court to revise the state's criminal codes. He's an advisor to the Holy See's delegation to the United Nations, and he serves on advisory boards for Ave Maria School of Law, the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights, and the Society of Catholic Social Scientists. And I was really excited because I like when I actually figure something out, and I said, Ron, what, what, how did you end up working with, I'm going to try it, Pachepa, better, better, and he said, well, the Catholic connection, I said, I wondered about that when I saw your contacts, I thought, I bet we're going to hear a lot about a pope who got smeared, anyway, so Ron confirmed that would be one of the stories he's going to tell us in tonight's fascinating presentation, thank you, Ron, for being here. Thank you very much. I am really delighted to be here. When I first started working on this project, one of the first places I came was to the Spy Museum because I figured I needed to know about this stuff. This was kind of outside my, my, my league. Um, what I've done for many years now, I have written about uh, the Pope who was Pope during the Second World War, Pope Pius XII, who if you know him, you may know by his unfortunate moniker of Hitler's Pope, uh, John Cornwell wrote a book of that title that came out in 1999. And I, I go all around uh, the country talking about this kind of stuff. I, I, and I have been, uh, I've spoken at Duke, and I've spoken at Columbia, and I've spoken at UCLA, and I've spoken at Vanderbilt, and I, I spoke at the Sorbonne last year. But when I got invited to the Spy Museum, my daughter Lindsay, who's here today, said to my wife, Mom, the Spy Museum, that's like really legit. So. <laughs> Made the big time uh, uh, with that, and I'm happy to have you here, happy to have my daughter here. Thanks very much. Um, like I said, I, I've spent uh, the better part of the last uh, decade or decade and a half talking about Pope Pius XII, and I've done research, written books, written articles. I go around, and I always, at the end of the uh, presentation, I try to take questions, because Pius XII, you see, was a hero during World War II, and then uh, in the 1960s, suddenly he became 
uh, the Pope who didn't do anything to help the Jews. I, one of the pictures, this is a picture of him here, surrounded by the Israeli Philharmonic, who in 1955 came to play a concert of tribute for all the church under his leadership had done to protect Jews, which is inconsistent with, with, the, with the whole thing. But, but uh, I always take questions, and the question that troubled me the most was I was at a seminary in, uh, in Nebraska one time. At the end of my talk, a priest in the back raised his hand and said, Professor, I, I believe everything you say, but if all that is true, how come so many people believe that Pius XII was a bad guy? And I gave the standard stock answer. I said, well, there was this play, a play called The Deputy. It came out in 1963, about the same time as Vatican II, about the same time as uh, the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the same time as uh, the uh, diary of Anne Frank came out, and it just made people rethink things. I mean, there, was no, there never was evidence here. It was just, there was just this play. And that's really an unsatisfying answer, but it, it, it's the answer. In fact, usually when I ask people today, they'll still say that. And then uh, one day in 2007, I uh, came home late at night and actually, actually popped on uh, our, our, our television uh, uh, to the internet, and I'm flipping around and I, I see this uh, story, Jan Mahai Pachepa uh, says the play The Deputy, this thing that makes everyone think that the Pope was a bad guy, was part of an orchestrated campaign from the Soviet bloc intelligence agencies. He said, you know, it's not just something that happened. Uh, the play, he said, said, it was crafted by us, it was promoted by us, translated by us. I was part of it. I was part of actually helping pull for documents so we could try to air a, an, a, add an air of legitimacy to the play. And I uh, saw that, and, and, and it was like, that's really interesting. If, if that's right, if that's true, that explains a lot of stuff. But on the other hand, you can't just take it on face value that it's true. But the guy, guy named General Ivan Agents, um, uh, who was known through the, uh, uh, throughout Soviet intelligence for being someone who wrote false histories. According to uh, Pachepa, this guy who was famous for that had in fact written this false history, had crafted this play, a fictional play. And by the way, in fiction would work great because if someone said, well, that's wrong or that's wrong or that's wrong, you could say, well, of course, we had to do some for dramatic effect. So you couldn't really rebut anything that came out. Um, so it made me think this is worth exploring. Now, my first book was called Hitler, the War, and the Pope. And the first edition of it had come out in the year uh, uh, 2000. The, uh, the publisher had uh, asked for a second edition. And it's one of those things. You know, as an author, I'd written what I thought I wanted to write, and I thought I had a pretty good book as it was, and I can update, I can add a little footnotes, I can add stuff I've learned over the last 10 years and stuff, but I wasn't super excited about just giving a little brief update to what's going on. I, you know, I wanted to really do something important um, if I was going to rewrite the book. Otherwise, you know, why do it? I decided I'm going to investigate this charge that Pachepa has raised, figure out whether there's anything to it. So I, I had a guy offer to pay for me to go to Russia and try and find this stuff, and find, find, find the documents that prove this is true. I said, look, I don't know where to go in Russia. Uh, this is KGB stuff, so I assume it's hidden pretty well if, it, if it's anywhere. And if I find it, I can't read Russian. So, you know, that's, <laughs> save your money. That's not really going to work. I went to the public library, and I said, I bet you there's, I bet you if, if this is true, I bet someone else has written a book somewhere that kind of supports it, some former KGB guy. So, so I went to the shelves, I got all the, the, the books I could find written by former KGB guys, and I sat down and started flipping through them. And within 20 minutes, I found one written by a guy, uh, by the way, who's affiliated with the Spy Museum, uh, who he talked about uh, how he had uh, co-opted a small magazine in New York how he originally helped pay off some debts, wrote some letters, soon was placing articles, and eventually this magazine became an outlet for Soviet propaganda. And I knew that that magazine was one that had promoted the deputy heavily. So it wasn't a lot, but within 20 minutes, I'd found a pretty serious connection. So I went ahead, working uh, uh, on the book, uh, uh, my, my second edition of Hitler, the War, and the Pope. Um, and I explored more about the background. I decided I'm going to investigate this thing. Well, the play of the deputy 
was brought to stage by this producer, Erwin Piscotter. Piscotter actually is a theatrical legend. He was a very insightful, brilliant guy who, uh, who figured out how to use projections and, and uh, use the, the uh, uh, theater for political purposes beyond whatever had been done in the past. Um, he uh, uh, came to the United States and trained with uh, Marlon Brando. He, he helped cultivate Marlon Brando and Tony Curtis uh, and some other, James Dean, some other important actors in the United States, he helped develop them. He, he was a guy who had uh, uh, done plays and, and worked on things. He had written false histories. Uh, uh, he had uh, produced these plays. And he had, from the beginning, done plays at the request of the Communist Party. He was a member of the German Communist Party. He, uh, uh, when, when he was ready to produce a play, he'd put the play up and he'd have the communist authorities come and look at it and figure out whether it was okay. If they did not approve, he would delay a play for two weeks because the communist authorities didn't approve of it. Now, this is not conjecture. He, in, in 1930, he moved to the Soviet Union. See, that's really not doing it. Yeah. There we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, he, uh, in uh, the... Uh, uh, you can see what he, in 1929, he wrote many statements like this, but this is at the end of a play in 1929 where he explained how, as a communist, he believed the theater had to be used to advance the communist agenda. That was his purpose, that was his goal, that's what everything uh, was about with him. And he was that way throughout his life. He came to the United States in uh, the 1940s, was here in the 1950s. Uh, he left when the House Committee on Un-American Activities got to, began to get hard on him and he went back to Germany. When he went back to Germany, it was before the Berlin Wall had gone up. So he's in Berlin, and theater in Berlin at this time was highly political. There were subsidized plays promoting democracy, and the theaters would, for instance, accept German marks, uh, East German marks, to come in. They were worth a lot less than West German marks, but they wanted folks from East Germany to come, and, and, and East Berlin to come, and see the capitalist productions. And same way on the other side, in East Berlin, uh, the, the plays were subsidized in, a, in an effort to try to get propaganda for that side. And people went freely back and forth for a long time. And then the Berlin Wall goes up. And when the Berlin, Berlin Wall went up, the folks in East Germany said, we no longer have an outlet for our plays. So they decided to establish a theater in West Berlin, especially for communist propaganda. They got Piscotter to run this theater and Piscotter chose the deputy for the first play to be done at this theater. So you've got a theater that's designed for the ex uh, precise purpose of producing communist propaganda. You've got a guy who's devoted his life to doing that, and they picked the deputy as the first play to produce. Piscotter, in fact, said, you know, this, the deputy gives meaning to, to what I've tried to do my entire life. Uh, uh, it, it's the kind of play I've always wanted to do. When the play came to the United States, Herman Schumann, on the right there, was the producer who took the play to Broadway. He took it to Broadway. Uh, he was the only guy at the time, the only producer at the time, who advertised in the Communist Daily Worker. He had been sanctioned by the, criminally sanctioned by the House Committee on Un-American Activities, uh, very clearly, you know, involved in communist activities. At a time, by the way, 19, late 1950s, 1960s, you didn't do that lightly. There was no joking about, I'm an old pinko in 1960. You know, it was, it was if you were, you clearly were. Uh, Barney Rossett was the publisher who published the book, The Deputy. He also published a separate book about the deputy called Storm Over the Deputy. Rossett, late in life, was asked about his religion. He said, I never had a religion, so I became a communist, asked my religion, and you better believe that's what I was. Um, when the uh, play had to be translated into French, they got this guy, uh, uh, Jorge uh, Semprin. He was from the Spanish Communist Party's Politburo, and he had specialized in clandestine operations. He's the guy who translated the play uh, into uh, French. I'm at home one night, and uh, this story clicks up on the internet. I.F. Stone, I.F. Stone was in fact a paid uh, communist agent that was debated for a long time. He was a he was a journalist, a muckraker kind of guy. He used to be a talking head back in the 1970s on on news shows. 
He's a guy who also strongly promoted the play. All these pieces start coming together for me as I'm studying this stuff. There's a, a, a magazine that was originally a Catholic magazine called Ramparts. The play is getting ready to open on Broadway, and uh, there's a big backlash trying to shut it down, not let the play open. Ramparts, which is out of San Francisco, a little local magazine, comes to New York, rents a floor on the Waldorf Astoria, uh, sends telegrams all over to every publication you can think of in New York, invites them to the, uh, to the play, ha has a big rally in support of the play, and really makes sure that the play does not get shut down. Now, how did this little magazine from San Francisco afford to do that? Well, within two years, it was quite openly a front uh, for the Soviet movement. And uh, the CIA, in fact, devoted 18 agents to studying Ramparts. Ramparts did become more of a national voice later on. It dropped its Catholic identity. It was very convenient to be Catholic at the time, though. In fact, it's sort of a perfect disinformation campaign. It's Catholics out to defend this criticism of the church. Uh, if it was someone else defending it, if, it was Cat if it's Catholics uh, opposing criticism, well, you discount that. If it's non-Catholics who, who are defending the, uh, the, the play, you, you know, people wouldn't put so much faith. But when it's Catholics uh, saying the play should be heard, it gets extra, extra power. The person known to the world as the author of The Deputy is this guy, Ralph Hochuth. Ralph Hochuth, a German Protestant guy who uh, um, was later, after the, the, the play The Deputy, uh, wrote a, a play criticizing Winston Churchill and saying Churchill was involved in an assassination attempt to try to, and where he killed a lot of innocent people, including a, 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 a Polish general. Hawketh, um, it's very interesting because when that play, the next play is called Soldiers, when it's trying to be, they're trying to produce it in uh, England, the, uh, uh, the, the, the censors in England tried to shut it down, tried to keep it from opening. And so artists rallied around him, the free speech cause. We should be free to criticize the government through art. And one of those guys who was with him at first, an actor named Carlos Thomas, uh, got near uh, Hawkeuth, realized Hawkeuth didn't have the facts to back up what he was claiming. And so uh, he gradually pulled back from Hawkeuth ended up writing a book about Hawke, saying this guy changes his, his uh, direction, the motivations in his play back and forth, he has nothing to back it up, and he's constantly afraid that he's going to be bumped off by English secret agents, called it the old firm, um, which just seemed like it was crazy in the book as it was written. But if we plug in the fact that Hawke, in fact, was engaged in a covert operation against the West, uh, it no longer seems crazy, it begins to make sense. British Intelligent Report from 1969 concluded, there are various grounds for suspecting that Hawkeuth's activities are part of a long-term Soviet disinformation operation against the West. It can also be argued that Hawkeuth is engaged in some decomposition exercise that he's attempting to destroy the fundamental value of a free society from its religions to its heroes. In 1969, British intelligence wasn't able to prove this, but they were on point. They had figured out that Hawketh was doing something suspicious, believed he was probably funded by the Soviet uh, Union, but wasn't, they weren't really able to prove it at the time. Well, I did all that stuff. I looked at all those things, and I concluded, by the way, I'm doing all this research for the new edition of my book, Hitler, the War and the Pope, and I'm constantly worried, am I just slipping off into, you know, I've, I've written a book that's already got the Nazis in the Vatican. Do I need to add the Kremlin? Or am I just going to put me in a corner with a tinfoil hat on next? I mean, <laughs> I, you really, we're worried about that. And I come home every day, and there, I find a new little piece of the puzzle. New, and there, there comes a point when you say, it makes sense. It explains stuff. And so I wrote this chapter for the second edition of Hitler, the War and the Pope, chapter 16. And then I decided to send it to Pachepa, the guy who'd written the article in uh, the new uh, Oxford, the, the, uh, uh, the National Review Online. And I, I didn't know how to get in touch with them because, well, for reasons that, that are obvious or will be in a mo moment, uh, they got it to him. They sent him my chapter, and he got in touch with me. And we have had a great email relationship primarily. 
since then, although we have met in person. Um, Pacepa is a fascinating man. Pacepa was the number two guy under Ceausescu in Romania. He was the head of, it was called the DIE, the DAI. I mean, I feel like it's a get smarts thing sometimes, but it was the equivalent of the CIA, more or less, foreign intelligence uh, in, in Romania during communist times under Ceausescu. He had been a bright young man, bright your boy, did well in school, got drafted into this area. His father had always talked about America. He'd always wanted to come to America. But uh, that dream, you know, uh, of becoming an American never happened. Uh, Pachepa decided to, uh, uh, he, 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 well, he became head, and he realized that uh, he was pretty good at what he was doing. And he really realized how good he was one day at the White House. I mean, he lived a life of luxury, by the way. I mean, he hung out with Khrushchev and Castro and Carter and, and, and world leaders. Uh, really, he was one of the privileged few in one of these communist societies. And this day with Ceausescu and Jimmy Carter uh, in the Rose Garden, Jimmy Carter, and, and, and uh, Pachepa's not in the picture, but Pachepa was there. Uh, Pachepa hears Jimmy Carter say, this new man, this Ceausescu, this new communist, this new man uh, from Romania, this great leader, a guy we can do business with, a new opening between our nations. Pachepa hears this, and Pachepa knows Ceausescu's a butcher committing genocide against his people. He says, I can't believe we fooled the leader of the United States this badly. Um, but they had. Uh, that was part of uh, Pachepa's job was to fool the West, and indeed he had done so. Uh, Pachepa had made his mind up that if the time ever came where he was asked to, to be involved in an assassination, he would defect. And that happened about three months after the incident in the, uh, the Rose Garden. Pachepa uh, uh, was asked to, to kill somebody. He went back to his home. He picked He had been playing violin since he was seven years old. He went to his mother's portrait played a, 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 a song to his mother's portrait, his mother passed away, laid down the violin, has not touched it since, uh, went to the American embassy and, and got uh, flown to Washington. When he came to Washington, by the way, Jimmy Carter didn't believe him. Jimmy Carter wanted to send him back to Romania, which would have been a death sentence. Absolutely. So um, fortunately, the CIA, the folks who were involved in the debriefing debrief process, uh, did believe him, talked Jimmy Carter out of sending him back, uh, but he was being debriefed for three years. And during these three years, uh, you know, he told all kinds of stuff that eventually became the book Red Horizons, which was published in, uh, I want to say, 1987. Um, during this time, when Pachepa left, Chichevsku, first of all, is outraged. He uh, puts first a $1 million bounty on Pachepa's head, then adds a second $1 million bounty. He d uh, dispatches Carlos the Jackal, an assassin, to go after Pachepa. Uh, Pachepa becomes aware of this. So today he lives under an assumed name, a new name, uh, and, which I don't know. I don't know where he lives or what name he lives under. The joke is, I know Superman. I don't know Clark Kent. Uh, and I told him that one day. I, I said, I know Superman. I don't know Clark Kent. And he said, what are you talking about? So I'm, I'm, he said, said, I'm milk toast. I, I, I'm involved in my church and very little else. In fact, one day, one of his neighbors went up to him and said, you know, you need to be more involved in the world. You know what's going on? Read this book. And gave him a copy of Red Horizons. <laughs> Which, I mean, if you can imagine that, uh, that's pretty funny. But uh, a a anyway, um, Pachepa uh, uh, eventually wrote this book. Uh, which uh, President Reagan called his Bible for dealing with dictators. If you know Pachepa, you will hear about disinformation. Pachepa says uh, disinformation is you want something that comes from a trusted source which has a nugget of truth and cannot be disproven, so you have no original documents about it. So a play, a fictional play, um, which we trust artists, uh, there's a nugget of truth, and Pius XII did not repeatedly use the bully pulpit, uh, and there were no original documents involved. Uh, there are stories like that. If you think about during the war, during Vietnam, for instance, if something came out of the Kremlin about how American soldiers were behaving, you would dismiss it. If it came from Washington or a, a national American newspaper or a, an American soldier 
who had been deceived. I'm not saying uh, uh, John Kerry was part of, of intentionally spreading disinformation, but Pacheco said, when he heard what, what uh, John Kerry said, he said, my God, he's repeating uh, you know, our disinformation. Kerry was a you know, young soldier who believed what he heard, what he heard from the world's foremost disinformation machine. He repeated it. That became much more persuasive than any, anything that would have come directly out of the Kremlin. And in our book, we trace the history of disinformation back from the Potumkin village. You, you may have heard of the, the if, if you don't know the, the origin of the phrase, I mean, there really was this, this Russian uh, prince or emperor who wanted to impress some visitors, particularly, I think, a visiting princess. And, and so they built a fake city, like you see in a Hollywood movie set or something, to make it look like there was a great amount of wealth when, in fact, there wasn't. Uh, but we, we see this in uh, Soviet uh, history. We go through some. There you see uh, Lenin up on top. Now to the the right, to your right on the podium, is Trotsky and another uh, person who was vying for power with Stalin. When the picture came through after Stalin's editing, those guys are gone. So you don't let them be next to Lenin, right? And uh, Stalin, when he's in power, okay. First the companies here. Then I, I don't know if Stalin gave him an elbow and he's over the edge there. Or, or what, but you know, uh, Stalin edited uh, uh, pictures like that. One of the important things about uh, disinformation that Pacheco and I, when we first got going, we had some, some difficulties actually in language because he tends to use this language, which I didn't like. In framing in America, when you hear somebody, we frame somebody, you're thinking you frame them with a crime, you frame them with doing something bad, right? But Chapo always said there's good framing and bad framing. You can frame somebody as a, a great leader. You can frame somebody as a nice guy. And you can, it's just we're not used to that in our common lingo. But uh, the term glasnost, which I think if you ask your average American, they would think glasnost would mean an opening and a, a warming and agreement. Glasnost actually means shining up of the leader's image, polishing the, the leader's image. So glasnost was what Pacheco had been doing for Ceausescu, polishing up his image, making him look like a, uh, a, a good guy and trying to fool everybody else. Khrushchev famously had a secret speech, which he gave condemning Stalin. Uh, it was secret. It wasn't supposed to go out anywhere except copies were handed to CIA and Mossad and other groups immediately so that they could discover the secret speech so, indicating what? That Khrushchev said, you know, all this bad stuff that had been going on, that was Stalin. I'm a new guy, new era. Now, if he had just come out and said that, no one would, you know, say, yeah, you promise, politicians promise. But if he said it secretly and we discovered it, well, wow, that's much more exciting. But this idea of blaming the last guy, polishing the, the current leader's uh, uh, image, blaming the last guy, you see Brezhnev accuses Khrushchev of destroying... Uh, uh, com communist unity. Gorbachev accuses Brezhnev. Every Russian Soviet leader that came along, they've done that. The new leader has his image enhanced. Everything is blamed on the past leader. Khrushchev, the other thing Khrushchev did was he internationalized this information. It had been just from leaders kind of one to the other within Russia or the Soviet Union. He used it as a matter of international weaponry, really, by uh, by, by when he attacked Pius XII. He drew upon what happened after World War II. After World War II, we had areas such as Poland, Croatia, and Hungary, where you had strong uh, religious leaders in religious nations who had been appreciated by the, the public, who when the communist leaders came in and took over, at first they kind of snuggled up to them and said, hey, we're just like, like your Christian leaders here, but of course, these guys soon became problems. So what did you do? You associated them with the Nazi party. Khrushchev decided to do the same thing to Pope Pius XII, and that's how the play The Deputy really happened. The same basic thing they had done to a lot of Christian leaders uh, in former Christian areas after the Soviet sphere had expanded following World War II, you accuse them of being soft on the Nazis. By the way, what we talk about in the book, uh, the same people, the same methods that were used to uh, attack Pope Pius XII, the Soviets also used to point fingers in other directions after the Kennedy assassination. 
got a couple chapters on that, talking about uh, there was serious reason to look at the Soviet Union after the, uh, after the assassination of JFK. But immediately it was, oh no, they don't care about him, oh no, uh, Oswald was a nut, the Soviets had no interest in him. Uh, immediately, there were, and, and the same people who wrote books uh, condemning Pius XII wrote books uh, exonerating the Soviet Union. They were funded by the same people. I mean, it, it's really amazing. And for me, one of the interesting things was this past November, I watched all the doc. you know, every, every November they have, and this was the 50th year, I guess, so they have the documentaries about the Kennedy assassination on the History Channel, or as my wife calls it, the N NTV, all Nazis all the time, because I watch that a lot. But, uh, uh, I, I watched them all again this year with sort of new eyes. And it was really funny because it's all like, uh, Oswald doesn't matter, nobody cared about Oswald. Uh, although surprisingly, when they moved him to this village, they gave him the nicest apartment in town. There's a coincidence, you know, it, they just dis run over, dismiss those things. But uh, the same people in the United States that were saying Pius XII is a bad guy were saying uh, it was the CIA who killed uh, John F. Kennedy, not the communists. Ramparts Magazine, same authors, everything. And one of the most interesting stories, it didn't end, by the way. This is one of the most interesting stories we go into, I think. Uh, Pope John Paul II, early in his papacy, I mean, this is a guy who was very important in bringing down communism around the world. But early in his papacy, uh, there was a plot to destroy him. They wrote a false history, much like the deputy. They wrote a false history, uh, uh, which was a diary, a diary of a woman who would have known him when he was a bishop in Poland. And the diary was about their affair. And they were going to plant this in an apartment and let Polish police find it. It was disinformation at its purest. They get an agent to go plant the false diary in an apartment. He gets drunk and has a car crash. And trying to get out of trouble, he gives away the secret of what he was doing. So, uh, but it, can you imagine if he hadn't gotten drunk, hadn't had the car crash. If they had discovered early in the pontificate of John Paul II, a diary of a woman who'd had an affair with him, you know, the world could have been very different than it is today. But that was a disinformation campaign that failed. George Weigel writes about this in his second biography of uh, John Paul II, if you're familiar with that. But things have continued. Uh, the, the, the one thing that, that the Soviets did very well, infiltrated international groups, established international groups, sent people, uh, around the world, sent him into the World Council of Churches to develop liberation theology, to try to politicize Christianity, to focus on politics more than religion, um, really weakening the, 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 the structure itself. And this guy, Yuri Andropov, not when he became president of the, of the Soviet Union, but when he was head of the KGB, he's the one who really weaponized disinformation because he looked at the anti-Semitism that already existed in the Middle East. And he figured out, we can turn that into a weapon against Israel and Israel's great supporter, the United States. We can cultivate, it's almost like a Petri dish. We can cultivate this anti-Semitism and weaponize it and have these people fight against our enemies. One of the things they did was translate the protocols of the elders of Zion, a horrible uh, uh, forgery uh, that purports to be minutes of a meeting of Jewish people plotting to take over the world and, and getting blood from children to do it and just horrible stuff. It made a splash in the late 1800s, thoroughly discredited by 1920 at least. Uh, but it's very, really popular in the Middle East because as Pachepa said, every month in the last years before he defected, they sent thousands of copies into the Middle East. Uh, there's an account I, I, I blogged on a uh, uh, anti-Semitism, anti-anti-Semitism blog, uh, and it, recently about this, wrote a little article about it, because uh, there, there was somebody who said he traveled through the Middle East and he would ask people, have you ever heard of the Protocols of Elders of Zion? It's, oh yes, I have my copy right here. Uh, or have you ever heard of a plot of the Jews to take over the world? Well, yes, I have the proof right here. And, and it's, it's thoroughly accepted. This is actually, there's an icon like this, you can get on your iPhone if you live in the Middle East, the, the protocols uh, for your iPhone uh, in, in Arabic. Uh, it was serialized, made into a, a TV series on Egyptian TV about 10 years ago, and it's been broadcast throughout the Middle East uh, ever since on a fairly regular basis. More than that, though, 
uh, Yasser Arafat. Uh, for a long time, people thought he was born in Palestine and grew up there, and, and that's why he led the PLO. He was born in Egypt. He was educated in uh, the Soviet Union. He was trained in sort of terrorist activities that way. Pachepa knew him. This is a, a picture of him with Ceausescu. Uh, Pachepa was familiar with the training that, that they went on to cultivate the, uh, the, the, the terrorism that existed. And in fact, uh, this is the uh, 1968 attack on L L, uh, LL uh, airplane in Athens. But there are all these, when we go through the list, and if my screen was working here, I'd, I'd read it, but you don't need me to read them anyway. But all these uh, terrorist attacks that the KGB took credit for while Pachepa was still uh, working in intelligence. This is one of the things, by the way, that amazed me too. Pachepa would say things like, you know, well, in the uh, KGB guidebook, they took credit for this or took credit for that. I'm, I'm thinking, there's no way in the world they print that they're taking credit for something. And, you know, I end up researching it and, and sure enough, he's not the only one who says it. Other people write about, you know, a lot of times I don't get access to the original books, but other, other writers also have written and, and talked about and said, you know, this is in that book or, 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 or whatever book. The thing today, one of the things today that's most scary is in Russia today. Um, when Pachepa watched what happened with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, he said they had a plan in place in Romania that said if communism ever falls, what we're going to do is get some young leader type stick him up in a, in a little city. When things calm down, bring him back, let him be the leader, and put other uh, strong communists, intelligence types around him. And if you look at what happened in Russia, that's precisely what has happened there. But Chapin says, I don't know if Russia had that plan, but they're following to the T what we would have done on the plan we had written. Uh, and uh, uh, Putin, the thing about it is, he is surrounded, it, when, when the Soviet Union fell, when, when Nazism fell in Germany, you had denazification panels. You had hearings where you put people, uh, 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 you know, test them. Are you really a sincere Nazi? And if you were, you didn't get to stay in your same position. You didn't get to stay in authority, in power. We removed you. Never had that in the Soviet Union. The same people who were there one day are there the next day. And in fact, with Putin in charge, he's brought former intelligence officers back into him. So there's really a, a, a government being run by intelligence officers in Russia today. And uh, of course, there is Glasnost, there's the, the warm fuzzy. I, was, I couldn't decide between this or the shirtless one where he's on the horse, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I thought, people, people told me more people have not seen this one before. But, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, that's why it's scary. Um, and what, what about today in the United States? Pachepo risked everything to come to the United States. He had a life of privilege. Uh, he, you know, he could have stayed in Romania, hung out with world leaders, had you know, millions of dollars. And, and he's actually got a, a court verdict where he's got millions of dollars in art that he could go collect if he knew how to kind of come out of hiding and be able to do that. I mean, he was a wealthy, wealthy guy, living a life of, of privilege, risked it all, left family and friends and everything to come to the United States. And now he's here and he's looking at what's happening in the United States. And he sees us giving great praise to the current leader, songs and schools and stuff named after him, blaming all failures on the previous leader. We see great concern over things like Benghazi. I guess the new report came out yesterday. I have not had a chance to read it. That may be, may be better, but you see religion under assault. You know, it's not a coincidence that everywhere communism goes, religion is attacked. Uh, the Latin, you know, uh, atheism is inherent to communism. It's not a coincidence. It can't thrive where there are Judeo-Christian values. Um, at some level, if communism is going to thrive, I have to convince you that it's okay to kill him to take his property. He's got to share, and if he won't share, you have to know it's okay to kill him. And if we have Judeo-Christian values, you're never going to agree to that. 
So we have to cut down those values. Religion is under attack in the United States today. We see the legislative process being avoided. We see government spying on its citizens in a way that, you know, hasn't happened before. And not, not everything is just from the current administration here. I'm not just blasting the current administration. It's a lot of these things have been building for many years, even uh, uh, prior to the current administration. But these are signs of trouble. I think the book, Disinformation, I've, I've called it both a love letter and a warning to America. I mean, Pacheco really loves America. He's a true blue American guy. When you talk to him, he gets misty about things and, and, and values, and he's a wonderful man. He's funny, uh, but he's worried where the country's going. And this book was about that. It's saying, hey, I love you. We can get back on track, but you got to recognize that there's some serious problems going on, and, and we need to correct those things. He's an old man, and he wants to, to try to set things right before he passes away. It's been my privilege to work with him. It's been my privilege to talk to you tonight, and I'll be happy to take any questions. You, you talk about the, uh, the play right. and what a great success it was. And, and obviously, if it managed to trash a pope for the following 30, 40 years, I would, I would agree with you completely. Um, my father had worked for Radio Free Europe back in the 50s and 60s. And I'm curious, with, with that background, is there anything that comes to mind that, that the West did as well against the Soviet Union? I'm so glad you mentioned Radio Free Europe. If, if, yeah, if you want to, and one of the things it did, it serialized uh, Pachepa's book, uh, Red Horizons. And serializing it led very much to the unrest that led to the taking down of Ceausescu. And one of the mo more interesting things, I mean, that, that's, uh, I uh, talked to a guy who grew up in Romania, works for Radio Free, Free Europe today. And he told me that uh, he was uh, actually at an event one time where there, they're uh, uh, entertaining Ceausescu. It's kind of like we see in North Korea, where they have the dance and the parades and everything, entertain the great leader. And uh, they were chanting, peace Ceausescu, peace Ceausescu. And suddenly some of the workers held up their signs so their faces couldn't be seen and started to say, peace Pachepa, peace Pachepa. And it led to uh, uh, Ceausescu's break. Ceausescu actually had a mental breakdown after Pachepa defected before Ceausescu was, was, you know, ousted. But uh, Radio Free Europe was very important in many things, but, but in fact, serializing Red Horizons was, was one of the most, yeah. Other questions? Right. You know, I'm a teacher. I start calling on you if you don't raise your hand, so. <laughs> How's, uh, sorry, how successful has the recent pushback against the Hitler's Pope myth been, and what can you or anybody else do to help that effort? Well, thanks. Uh, I have, I've been trying to do a lot. I've been doing a lot of talks, uh, writing a lot of articles and books. We've made some advances. Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, Yad Vashem in Tel Aviv used to have Pope Pius XII listed with a very negative comment. We've got that change to where it is neutral, which is, a, 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 I think, an advancement. The Holocaust Museum here in uh, Washington, when it first opened, had a film that was pretty critical of Pius XII. They, they've taken at least, they've either changed films or taken that part out of it, so it no longer is critical. We're beginning to see uh, significant historians seeing through this and writing, Martin Gilbert, Sir Martin Gilbert, uh, uh, you know, a noted historian has come out strongly in defense of Pius XII. The, the thing about it is, it, it, this is a, a fascinating little tidbit, but, you know, I talked about in Croatia and Hungary and other places where, where these, these bishops and, and other religious leaders were prosecuted. 1960s, when this first thing bl blows up, they, they had these fake trials where they manufactured evidence. Out of Croatia, where uh, Stepanak, Cardinal Stepanak was put on trial, uh, before he even went on trial, some folks escaped uh, and, and said, we forged the documents, here's how we did it. They actually had microfilms that said, you know, we, we forged these documents, here's how we manufactured his signature and did all this kind of stuff. But of course, it meant nothing to the Croatian authorities. But so that's in, you know, late 1940s, early 1950s. 1960, uh, 
Carlos Falcone wants to write a book about Pope Pius XII, so he writes the authorities in Croatia and said, gee, I'd like to look at your evidence. And he writes a whole book about Pius XII that's based entirely upon this manufactured evidence that we now know is manufactured. Falcone, maybe there's an excuse. Maybe he wouldn't have known. But uh, there, John Cornwell, who wrote the book Hitler's Pope, relies on Falcone. There's no excuse for that because when communism fell, in Croatia, the first thing that the new parliament did was apologize for the false framing and trial of Cardinal Stepanak. So I, 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 this gets kind of inside baseball for some people. I see some people glazing over. Sorry. But. <laughs> Here's a question here. I'm kind of curious as to um, what the reaction uh, of Russian society was after Ceausescu's were overthrown and how the uh, Russian government reacted to that. You know, that's a really good question that I'm not sure I really know the answer to. Uh, I, you know, I, I, within Romania, I think the, the, the population seemed to uh, embrace it. However, there, there is today a significant segment that's still sort of... Uh, remains loyal to Ceausescu. And there's actually been an attack in recent years uh, on the, the credibility of my co-author Pachepa. Who, th they're, they're folks who say he was secretly working for the KGB. Uh, who, he brought down this good, they, they, they bought the glasnost, that they bought the idea that Ceausescu really was a good guy and they think that, that uh, Pachepa cut him out by the knees when he really shouldn't have. And uh, so he's, he's had some attacks, although there was just a six hour documentary on Romanian TV uh, talking about you know what a great guy he was so the vast majority of people recognize that that he's the good guy in that thing but there is there are some folks who still think Tito was a great guy and I'm sure Mussolini and Hitler have their fans as well question over here I, I really am not familiar with the deputy. Could you give us some background on sure. what that was? You know, I'm so, you know, it's one of these things. I, I don't know how much to go into some of these issues, but the deputy was a play that uh, made a splash in Germany in 1963 on Broadway in 1964. It essentially, it was made into a movie, by the way, about 10, 12 years ago called Amen. Uh, it's essentially the story of a, uh, a good Nazi, a good Nazi who sees what horrible things are going on and wants to go tell the Pope. And he goes through all kinds of ordeals to go tell the Pope. When he gets and he tells the Pope, the Pope doesn't care, is basically the point of it. Uh, and um, it doesn't depict the Pope as doing evil stuff, but it depicts him as not doing anything. And that is sort of the idea of the silent pope or, or the bad pope. And the thing about it was they added a historical appendix called Sidelights on History that's, that kind of said this is really real. Now you can go through and pick those things apart, but again, it's a fictionalized play. So if you point to a problem, they say, well, you know, we're looking for the overall honesty. The, the specifics don't matter. So it was really a, a brilliant piece. Of, if, if you want to destroy somebody's reputation, if you can get a play and you can make sure it gets on Broadway and, and people, when they say there's something wrong with it, you can't really respond. It really worked well. Do you see uh, Putin using uh, disinformation? And if so, how? <sighs> <laughs> uh, you know, when, uh, when Pachepa first told me Three or four years. We started working together. I think about 2009. I, you know, I didn't keep a diary. I didn't know we we're going to be working together. At first, I was just asking him to look at this chapter I wrote for the other book. He he said Putin is really a bad guy who's who who's bringing back the old Soviet Union, and I kind of scoffed because I, you know, I'm reading, you know. Well, I can't read Newsweek, any, Newsweek anymore, it's gone, but you know, I, I, I read the newspapers, uh, but I'm, I'm, I wasn't uh, someone who's really studied the Soviet Union, and that's not what I heard on the Daily News. Putin was supposed to be sort of the new guy. But if you followed the news over the last year or year and a half, there's a lot of folks, a lot of our politicians, a lot of our, our news agencies who are saying, you know what, modern Russia is acting a whole lot like the old Soviet Union. And it really makes sense because it's the same people with the same basic philosophy 
Um, so, I mean, do I have a specific instance of, of what he's doing with this, this information other than uh, sort of how he uh, presents himself? I actually had somebody ask me the other day, well, Putin's a Christian, so, you know, he's got to be better. And so I, I went and I looked it up, and, and Putin actually did, was asked, are you a Christian? And he said, that's not something I feel comfortable answering. Uh, his mother had given him a cross, but his father was a avowed atheist. Um, so... The, the imagery, the imagery certainly seems to fit. He's blaming everything on his predecessor, and they're presenting him as a, a great man of the future. So that seems to be, at least that part of it fits. Questions here and here? I got one for the front row. Uh, Putin uh, was recently in the Vatican with Pope Francis, and Putin presented a Virgin Mary icon to Pope Francis. Uh, Putin crossed himself, bent over, kissed the icon. Uh, the Pope followed suit. Uh, there seemed to be negotiations underway between the Vatican and the Russian Orthodox Church, which I understand is controlled by the KGB or the FSB. Uh, I'd like to get your comments on what the Pope is doing, the current Pope, uh, with Putin, and then ask you as well whether you think Edward Snowden, the NSA leaker, now living in Moscow, and WikiLeaks are part of Russian disinformation campaigns against the West. Two uh, really good questions. As to the first one, the Pope, understand and, and, you know, one of the, the, the nugget of truth in some ways, uh, disinformation about the church during World War II, is the church continues to maintain relations even with very evil empires, very, very bad organizations. Because the church, it's not a matter of, like the United States having a trading part partner. It's about there are people there who need priests, who need sacraments, who need to be helped with their spiritual journey. So the church has, would have relations with communist China, with North Korea, uh, if, if it will help. And it's not about money. It's, not, it's, it's about helping the people. It's very rare that the church will impose the kind of thing that happened in Mexico in the 1920s or something where the church will actually withdraw its facilities. So, so the church will try always, I think, to, to maintain relations when we go, to, go at that level. Uh, as to Snowden and the WikiLeaks stuff, it certainly is interesting that he went to Russia, went to China. Uh, I, I certainly am highly suspicious uh, of his, his, his intents with, with uh, uh, what he did based upon how he's behaved since he stole the documents. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. I have no inside information about that. But as someone who looks at it, it doesn't seem like the first thing I would do, run to uh, Russia or China, um, unless there was something set up in advance, you had some reason to think that that would, I mean, is that, is that, would anybody think that's the first place you're going to run to one of those nations? I mean, you know, not me, so I'm highly suspicious of Snowden. Other questions? Go ahead, this gentleman here. <clears throat> hey, Ron, there obviously were a lot of uh, organizations in the former Soviet Union involved in disinformation party organizations, Soviet intelligence, uh, government direct, political directorates, et cetera. How did the Soviets view deception operations as related to disinformation? How did they, they well, I, I mean, they very much believed, of course, in deception and disinformation. And in, in, at some level, disinformation is a subset of propaganda. I mean, there's misinformation, there's disinformation, there, there's overt propaganda. So, I mean, this is it's the most, of, disinformation, we believe, is the most effective form because it's something you trust, whereas uh, if it's, you know, misinformation, you wouldn't necessarily trust, trust the source. So if I can, can, can make the source believable, then the message is much more powerful. And obviously, if you look at the num we have the numbers in the book about the number of people that the Soviets had employed in uh, intelligence and in spreading bad intelligence and in putting people. I, the long range vision, 
that they had in terms of putting people into churches and into unions and into organizations, knowing that one out of ten might become viable, and that may be 15 years from now. But they did that. They took that kind of investment to create influence uh, is amazing. It shows a tremendous uh, uh, a belief in that, I think. Any other questions? Here we go. Up here. Yeah, I think I have more of a statement versus a question, but it's me trying Gives me to, a break. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more trying to understand the change of American society from the 1950s to today. And for years, I've been saying disinformation is more powerful than the truth when sponsored by media, academia, our politicians, and Hollywood. And um, uh, just in reading your book, I'm only a third of the way into it, uh, brings a lot of light to what I've been seeing in change and uh, kind of scary. And your book is just, uh, you know, expanding upon that, which I greatly appreciate, which is helping me understand things in this country a lot better. Um, other than that quote of just saying the disinformation part, that's all I have to say. Well, well, well th <laughs> thank you very much. You know, I mean, the, the thing about it is, disinformation does take on that life of itself. If you get it out there and people believe it, so I get it from a credible source, I get it in the New York Times, or I get it coming from a, a major American governmental official or, or somebody, and then everybody believes it. And now, you know, folks are coming to me and, and telling me stuff, and I, three people tell me the same thing. They may have all heard it from one source, but I'm kind of going to believe those three people. Uh, so, you, I, you know, I think the thing you have to do always is, is, is you know, use critical thinking. And if something sounds really out there, sounds kind of crazy, uh, double, triple check it. Don't just assume because we heard it from three friends and, and it was said on the radio yesterday that therefore it's true. If it sounds out of line, it, you know, America was founded upon principles that I think are pretty good and pretty solid. And I do think there are truths out there. And a big part of disinformation is undercutting the, the truths, particularly the truths that America was founded upon. So when those things are challenged, be particularly careful before you embrace them. Anything else? Yes. Oh, hold Please on. Say. What then um, would you say are the major Soviet disinformation themes today? And and. Let me ask you about concrete examples. The upcoming Russian Olympics in Sochi. Is this designed to somehow dupe or fool foreign audiences about the nature of Russia today? And, and what about just what happened this week with uh, the Putin government's decision not to allow David Satter to continue to report from inside Russia? Uh, the, the famous Moscow correspondent who had accused the FSB of carrying out uh, terrorism inside Russia that they blamed on Islamists. Well, I mean, there you go. Trying to control the source of the news is, is very typical within uh, a, a, a disinformation-based society or disinformation-based government. So if someone says something we don't like, we shut them down. I mean, that, that's very indicative. What's going to happen with the Olympics? I mean, I, I don't know, but the Olympics, certainly, if you think back to uh, uh, the Nazi era in, uh, in Berlin, Hitler certainly tried to use it that way to, to promote uh, the, the idea of Aryan supremacy. I have no doubt that, that Putin's, I, that we'll see Putin juggling and, uh, or wrestling and, uh, and, and, and uh, trying to present uh, his nation as, as something special. Uh, so I'm sure that, that uh, there's, and, but you know, it's a line between what is propaganda, what's disinformation, what's just good relations. And until you see it, it it's hard to know in advance what it's going to be, uh, I think. I, I think I'd be very suspicious. Though. I think you're right to be looking for it. Was there one over here, too? Um, <clears throat> with regard to uh, the, the Nazis that you were talking about earlier, since so got to mention the Nazis, um, Goebbels and the Big Lie. I'm I'm curious. Does your book talk about the Nazi take on on their relationship with with the Pope at the time, or is there anything referencing the well, yeah, material um, that they used? Th there is. Um, 
there, and I, I didn't go into it tonight, but uh, you know, my, my other book, Hitler, the War, and the Pope, uh, is all about that. It's all about the relationship. And we have to go into some of that for the background here. Uh, I always, you know, one of the things, that, uh, I was a Polish kid who grew up in a German neighborhood in St. Louis. So, you know, the neighborhood boys kept invading my backyard and partitioning it. It was horrible. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, no, nothing, against, nothing against the Germans. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we try to go over some quickly just so you get the flavor. We, you know, it, that wasn't the purpose of this book. But you do have, you do have to understand the Pius XII, in fact, the, the new, and I considered putting some of these slides in, but the New York Times and its main editorials, 19, uh, 1941 and 42, called him the lonely voice crying out of the silence of a continent. He's pointing his finger at Hitlerism, at the liberation of Rome. Every Jewish group in, a, you know, in the world is sending letters of thanks and praise. Same thing at his death. I mean, he was considered the one guy in Europe who, who you know, without an army, stood up to the Nazis. And, you know, from the time of his death, when he's viewed that way in 1958 to 1964, uh, it's flipped 180 degrees. So how does that happen? As I said, for a long time, I said it was the play. Thanks to Pachepa, uh, I understand that the play was just one, one aspect of a much larger disinformation campaign against him. Uh, that answered questions for me. I think it answers questions for a lot of people. And I appreciate you listening to me answer questions for you. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ron.